But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. As a, as a boy, I used to love um, making model aeroplanes. And um, so that we call them airfix kits, even if they weren't made by airfix, but plastic models that come on a frame and you, you cut them off and you sand them down and you, you glue them together and paint them. You know what I'm talking about. And, uh, and whenever I got a brand new one, first thing I'd do is, is open up the box and have a look at the, the model, the bits that were on the plastic frame. And then after that I'd look at the, the sheet of transfers, the water transfers with decals on and, and look at the images on there. And then I'd look at the box art and imagine whatever this plane, usually for World War II, would have done. And then maybe I'd have had a look at the instruction sheet before putting everything back in the box. Right, no, it's absolutely right. You don't spend time looking at the instructions. <laughs> uh, you maybe look at the instruction sheet and... Um, and then put everything back in the box and put it away. The instructions are not the exciting part. But they are very important. Now today's verse, Acts chapter 2 verse 16, is not the most exciting verse in the Bible. When I say to you, the verse that we're looking at tonight is Acts chapter 2 verse 16, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel, and that's it. You might think, really? We're going to spend a whole evening on that. It's not even the most exciting verse on this page, but it is vitally important. In fact, verse 16 is one of the most important verses in the New Testament. You know, there's one, one reason, not the only reason, but one reason why there's so much error in the church today. One reason why, why Christians devote themselves to things that aren't really biblical is because they haven't paid attention to Acts chapter 2 and verse 16. Now, the kit is far more exciting than the instructions, but without the instructions, you can't enjoy the kit. Unless you're very technically minded like Grant, you don't need the instructions, you can build the whole thing from scratch. I don't know, with propellers in the wrong places and all that. I need the instructions, you've got to have them or you can't enjoy the kit. So verse 16 is the instructions for how to understand unfulfilled biblical prophecy. Without this verse, you'll never be able to understand the Bible accurately. And this could get quite complicated, and a bit heady, so what we're going to do is take six simple steps. And the first one is incredibly simple. Step number one, God has given us his word. Everything that we need to know about God, everything that we need to know about ourselves, everything that we need to know about how we can be made right with God forever is in this book. One book, two testaments, 66 books within those two testaments. Everything God has to say to the world is here. Step one. Step number two, the Bible contains different kinds of literature. You know this, there are letters, there are books of history, there are books of law, and there are books of prophecy. And prophecy, to really dumb it down, is God speaking through a person about things that only God could not. Speaking to a person, giving a vision to somebody about the future that only God could not. Now most prophecy is very clear predictions that all of us can understand. But not all prophecy is like that. Some prophecy is not so clear because it's given in picture language. And so if you remember our series in Daniel, we saw that quite a bit. We got what we call apocalyptic literature, where Daniel is given visions rather than words. There's one vision that Daniel has, just to use an example, of a statue with a golden head, silver torso, and, and um, arms, and then a bronze waist, and then feet made out of iron and clay. And God explained what those things represented. They were physical things that represented something else. And God told Daniel there's going to be a succession of four mighty empires that are going to be increasingly brutal and decreasingly beautiful as they take over one from another. Step number three. A lot of prophecy in the Bible has already been fulfilled. All the Old Testament prophecies about the coming of a Messiah right back from Genesis chapter 3. The saviour who God was going to send to rescue his people from sin. They're fulfilled when the Lord Jesus came. But there are still some prophecies that are unfulfilled. And then we've got the book of Revelation. Which is prophecy given after the life, death, resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus. So that hasn't been fulfilled by Jesus yet. And four. We need to know how to understand those prophecies. Because if we can't interpret unfulfilled biblical prophecy, that means there's a whole chunk of the Bible that we're just doing guesswork with. And we might as well throw it away. 
And there's no point preaching on those passages. There's no point you spending a long time reading them and mulling over them in your, in your personal time with God's Word because you'll just come away confused. Or you'll end up doing what many Christians do and just make up your own interpretation of what it means. The danger of that, of course, is we can be wrong. We, we've got sin-damaged hearts. We've got our own biases, our own leanings, our hobby horses and ideas that, that we bring to the text. And, and so we can end up preaching our own ideas rather than God's. We can end up believing us rather than God and leading others, not after Christ, but, but down a, a trail of our own invention. Step five. We need the tools to interpret prophecy. And you all know the phrase, give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish, feed him for a life. Right? All heard that phrase before. I said this morning, I said it again. For some sat and ladies, it's teach a man to fish, you'll never see them again, right? <laughs> you teach a man to fish, Feed him for a lifetime. Because it's better to have the skills to get what you need rather than to just be given that thing once. It's better to have the ability to interpret all biblical prophecy than to just have somebody else's ideas, somebody else's answers to what one passage means. What we need is a method for tackling those passages of Scripture that predict something that yet, that's yet to be filled. The theological word is a hermeneutic. We need a hermeneutic, a method of interpreting the Bible. Now, different people have offered different suggestions of how we should approach the Bible in certain passages over history. They've given different ways, but we don't want their ways. We don't want man's tools. Daniel's got a little flimsy plastic spatula that he uses to play with Play-Doh. If I used that when I was frying chicken in a pan, the, the thing would melt into the pan. It's not good enough for the real work of cooking. And in the same way, man's tools will quickly melt in the pan of God's Word. The best tools that man has invented for mining the treasure of God's Word will quickly shatter against it if they're man's tools. We want a hermeneutic. We want a method that comes from, not man, but God. Last step. You still with me? Have you made it? Step six. God gives us the tools through Jesus. We learn how to interpret biblical prophecy by asking the question, how did Jesus interpret prophecy? He's the ultimate interpreter of God's word. He's the only theologian who never made a mistake. And then by extension, we can ask, how did the apostles, Jesus' chosen representatives, his infallible interpreters of Scripture, those that he gives to the church for all time so that we would know how to interpret the Bible and read and understand the Bible. How did they interpret the Bible? Well, turn with me to Luke chapter 4. Let's see how Jesus interpreted prophecy. Now, there are lots and lots of different examples that we could go to as we look at how Jesus and how the apostles interpreted prophecy. I just want to give you one of each. The first one is from Luke chapter 4, and I'm going to start reading at verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, talking about Jesus. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So Jesus did what you've done on the Lord's day. He's come to worship with God's people. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It's right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He goes into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he's given the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And this prophecy talks about liberty for captives, restoration of sight to those who are blind, liberty for the oppressed. Those are all very physical things, right? Freedom for captives, sight for the blind, freedom for those who are oppressed. All physical things. Things. And some of those things did happen during Jesus' ministry. There are some people who received their sight who were blind as Jesus healed them. 
But Jesus didn't send them slaves free. Jesus didn't rescue poor oppressed Israel from under the boot of wrong. And so was Jesus wrong when he said, today? And think about it. This is right at the start of his ministry. He hasn't given anybody their sight back yet. Today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. Has Jesus got it wrong? No. Because those physical predictions are fulfilled in a spiritual reality. Jesus sets free spiritual prisoners, rescuing souls, rescuing men and women from captivity in Satan's kingdom. He restores spiritual sight, opens people's eyes who think that they can see, but opens their eyes to see the truth of who he is and God's word. He saved people like legion from spiritual demonic oppression. And so what was prophesied in physical terms, Jesus understood and interpreted in spiritual terms. Now turn back to Acts chapter 2 and verse 16. We finally, halfway through the sermon, got to our verse. The disciples have just received the Holy Spirit. And the crowds have gathered because they've heard this noise of a rushing wind. And they've come and they've heard people speaking in their own languages. And they've been asking the question, what does this mean? Some have been mocking, saying these people are drunk. But others have been asking, what does this mean? What is happening here? And then Peter says to them in verse 16, but this is what, this is the exact answer to the question they're asking, what does this mean? This is what was uttered through the prophet Job. He's saying to them, what you are seeing here and now today, right here is what Joel prophesied about. Now look at the prophecy Joel made, because we get it quoted for us from verse 17 down to 21. It talks about the pouring out of God's Spirit, verse 17. And that's just happened. You know, we, we might say, well, Peter, yeah, you've nailed it there, but it's not too hard because God's just poured out His Spirit on all of the apostles and all of the disciples of Jesus. Yes, you're right, that matches up. But it goes on from there. And it talks in verse 17 about prophecy, visions and dreams. And then verse 19, there's blood and fire and vapour of smoke. And verse 20, the sun becomes dark. Verse 20, the moon turns to blood. And Peter is saying... This is that. What you're seeing today is what Joel spoke about in this prophecy. And we say, well, what are you talking about, Peter? There's no blood moon. There's no moon at all. It's nine in the morning. It's the third hour of the day. There's no solar eclipse. This doesn't make any sense. Unless Peter is handling the Bible in exactly the same way that Jesus did. That the physical things that are prophesied in the Old Testament are to be understood in spiritual terms. And what's pictured in the Old Testament as cataclysmic, world-changing events. The sun goes dark, the moon turns to blood, everything in the cosmos being turned on its head. It's a great way of saying that in, in vivid terms, isn't it? The, the whole universe is being turned upside down. It's actually referring to God turning the universe on its head spiritually. And sending his Holy Spirit to dwell in the hearts of sinners. That's more unthinkable than the, the moon turning to blood, the sun going dark. God should dwell with man. That is a cosmos transforming reality. After Pentecost, the world will never be the same. Just like Joel prophesied. So the way the Lord Jesus and the way that his apostles interpreted prophecy, the, the biblical way of interpreting prophecy is to understand physical objects and places and events as spiritual realities. And, and wherever an unfulfilled prophecy talks about a, a country, for example, even if that country is Israel, we don't expect that to be fulfilled in geographical Israel. Unless it's specifically and clearly talking about geographical Israel. We don't expect that to be fulfilled in geographical Israel. Because we're looking for a spiritual fulfillment. Now you might be starting to see why I'm making such a big fuss of Acts chapter 2 verse 16. Why this is so important. Because so many Christians today don't do this. And so they get into all sorts of trouble. Instead they've got their eyes fixed 
on geographical Israel, waiting to see prophecies fulfilled in physical terms. Thousands of Christians get giddy every time there's a blood moon or a solar eclipse. And they're waiting to see what's going to happen. They're on the edge of their seats. Is this going to be the moment that God does something? And then when there's not a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, then they're crushed. And it's all because they've refused to pick up Jesus' tools for digging in the mine of prophecy. And instead they've relied on men's way of understanding it. And so they misplace their energies, they mishandle God's word, and they misrepresent God's kingdom. The only consistent biblical way of approaching unfulfilled prophecy is Jesus' way. Maybe you're sat there thinking, why are we spending the whole Sunday on this? Well, this is the second time I've heard it, so, and, and Phil as well, so maybe you're in a better position than him. Why, why, do, why do we spend the first Sunday back after lockdown thinking on this? Well, well, the, the one main reason is that this is the passage that God gave me to preach on today. I, I tried to get away from it. My plan was to preach on, on something else, something cross-centric, and, and maybe the resurrection. I thought that would be the good thing for us to come back to, and I couldn't do it. Um, I felt that God would not allow me to prepare on that. So we carried on with our series and acts, and this is where we are. But here's three quick reasons why this is so important. Number one, because if you haven't got the right tools for mining in the quarry of God's word, you'll never find the diamonds that are there. Just like Daniel playing in the garden, digging in the dirt with his plastic spade, he's only going to make lines in the top of the dirt. He's only going to scratch the surface. You need a real spade to get in there and find what's buried. It's the same for us with God's word. We need the tools to dig. Otherwise, we'll never find what's there. Number two, why is this so important? Because you don't want to mishandle God's word. You don't want to misrepresent his kingdom. Number three, because this is going to come up again and again in the book of Acts. As we see the apostles doing this again and again. Interpreting the Old Testament prophecies in the same way. And now because we've handled it thoroughly this evening. We won't make reference to it again. Well, we'll make reference, but we won't go as deep as we have this evening. We've done it. We understand this now, God willing. Maybe nobody understands it. You can tell me about that afterwards and I'll go and cry. But uh, hopefully we get across. But hopefully you're, you're with me and you still follow me. And we won't need to go as deep when it comes up next time. We can just make reference. When General Douglas MacArthur, one of the most successful modern generals in the, the U.S. Army, was at military college. He was studying Einstein's special theory of relativity. And MacArthur could not, for the life of him, an incredibly intelligent man, could not get his head around this. And so he decided that he was going to memorize the, the textbook description, textbook definition. And one day, in the middle of class, he was called on to explain the special theory of relativity. And so MacArthur stood up, and he recited word for word what the textbook said. And just before he sat down, the professor said, and do you understand that, Mr. MacArthur? And he said, you could have heard a pin drop. As he said to the professor, no, sir. And then the professor said, neither do I, Mr. MacArthur. <laughs> and he dismissed the class. Maybe you're a professor and you followed every word that I've, that I've said tonight. Maybe it's gone right over your head. That's okay. We don't always tackle a theme like this every Sunday. And it is good for us from time to time to be stretched in God's word. To remember that though the gospel is simple enough for a child to understand, there is a depth and a complexity here that is commensurate with God who speaks it. But I want you to see one last thing from Joel's prophecy, that even if you haven't understood a single word I've said so far tonight, this is something that all of us can grasp, and really it's the most important thing here. Peter quotes the prophecy of Joel, and it's all building up to verse 21. All these things will happen. The world is going to be turned on its head. There is mountain, there's a mountain of cosmos-shaking events that are taking place. But right at the peak of that mountain, the reason that all of these things are happening is to draw our attention to the summit, verse 21. That this is the time, says Peter, this is that which Joel prophesied the moment in all of history when everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter is saying, this is that. 
people of Jerusalem, listen to my words. This is what you need to hear. This is that moment when everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't matter from this point on who you are or where you're from. You can be saved. Every single one of us needs to be saved. Because every one of us is a sinner. Your friends and family might not think you're that bad. They might not have a single negative thing to say about you. But when we measure ourselves against the one standard that matters, when we ask what does God think of us, well, every single one of us falls short. There's not a, a single person who's not broken God's law in many different ways. And because God is a God of justice, He's not going to allow a lawbreaker to go and punish. <coughs> now, there's only one penalty for our sin. We might think that breaking God's law is not a big deal. The little things that He calls us and, and challenges us on. No, no gossiping, no backbiting, no envy, no bitterness, no malice. These are just small things that we can't get away from. Not being anxious. Does God really expect that of us? We might think breaking those things is no big deal, but, but every sin is turning our back on the purest, best, most beautiful being in the cosmos. And so the smallest sin that we commit is worthy of the severest punishment. And so God says the wages of sin is death. How do we get out of that? Lots of people think that they could do it themselves by, by earning salvation by their good work. I'll get myself back into God's good books by doing the things that he wants me to do. But if a criminal tells a judge, look, I'm sorry, I, I killed that woman, but I'm going to be a good boy from now on, that's not going to help him. It's not going to work, no matter how good a boy he is. We can't hope to save ourselves 2,000 years ago because he loves you. God made a way for you to be saved. And the one who should punish us at immense personal cost has saved all who will call on him. The Lord Jesus died on the cross. He paid the price that you and I should pay. He took our, our sin away. So that God no longer has to count us guilty. And in place of our sin, he gives us his righteousness. His perfect life in place of our ruined ones. So that we become as good in God's eyes as Jesus himself is good. Why would God do that? Why destroy Jesus, the apple of his honour, to make a way for me to be saved? The Bible tells us the answer in Ephesians 2. But God being rich in mercy. Because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been set by grace. God's undeserved, unmerited favour and love. Look again at that verse. Take note of that one word. Everyone. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. The forgiveness of, and grace of God is not restricted. There's not a single person here who must think that that this is not for me. It is available to anyone who will call out to Jesus, who will confess their sin, say, I am a sinner and I need saving. I need rescuing. I need a saviour to take that sin away, to take the death that I deserve. Lord Jesus, why don't you do that for me and give me your righteousness in its place, that righteousness I could ever earn. You, you must do that. Jesus stands ready to welcome and receive you, but you must call out to everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. During the, the big flood, um, 2020, Phil and Andrea and my family, we went up and we stayed with George and Catherine on top, of the, on top of the hill. And there was one point, I don't know if you remember George, but Andrea's cat escaped from its box. And, um, and Phil and I were looking around the garden, desperately trying to find this cat, and we were shaking the, the treat bag and calling out the cat's name. But it was incredible, it was an overcast day, it was dark under the canopy of the trees, Andrea's cat is black, mostly black, so there was no way we were going to find this thing. And I was walking around the garden, shaking the tree bags, and Bella, Bella, and I was thinking in my head, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your time. And so Bella, Bella, and do this for 10, 15 minutes until eventually, and you hear it, and, and suddenly in the dark you can see there are just two eyes. There's no way of finding that cat until it made a noise. 
till it pulled out. No hope of it being saved. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, if you've never called out to Him, oh, don't risk your soul one moment longer. Don't go home with hell still hanging over you. God has made a way for you to be rescued. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray. Father, let it be true of us people who have called out to King Jesus. That we've come to the end of ourselves. That we've realised there's no way that I could ever hope of making myself right with you. The only way is if, if you do that work. Father, don't let us go home. Don't give us a moment's rest. Don't let us sleep tonight until we're certain that the Lord Jesus has come into our hearts, has poured out his spirit on us, has made us his, rescued us from our sin and made us his own. Father, we thank you for this simple reminder in this wonderful last verse of why we come together. We come to worship Jesus because he's my saviour. And we love you because you loved us first. While we're still in our sins, still in our trespasses, the mercy and grace of God was so great that it found me. Father, send your people home rejoicing in that. Don't let it be that we've just exercised our heads and not our hearts, that we've not been moved in love for the Lord Jesus. Help us to see his majesty and his worthiness again, we pray in his name, for his glory. Amen.